This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manassero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manassero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch, real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dogs, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe. Well, we have a, a great show today for you guys, and uh, I just uh, want to start off, actually, just to ask a question here. And uh, before I introduce our guest, I want to ask you, is real estate investing a business? And I think if you're perfectly honest, I think you will say yes. I mean, after all, you are involved in an enterprise that is focused on generating profits. And as such, you are running a business. And uh, you know, to that note, you need to start looking at your real estate investing as a real estate investing business. Well, today's guest is an expert at uh, starting and successfully running multiple businesses. Michael Michalowicz is the author of Profit First, which I'm sure you heard of. Uh, I've mentioned it a lot on the show. Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, and his newest release, which actually came out today, the date of this recording here, Clockwork. By his 35th birthday, Mike had founded and sold two companies, one to private equity and another to a Fortune 500 company. Today, he is running his third multi-million dollar venture, Profit First Professionals. Mike is a former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal and the former business makeover specialist on MSNBC. Over the years, Mike has traveled the globe speaking with thousands of entrepreneurs and is here today to share the best of what he has learned. Well, Mike, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Bill, it is a joy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we are thrilled. I mean, I... I I love your books. This newest one, I've just got a little chunk of, and I am so excited to, to uh, be able to devour this one, too. I think it's going to be great. But, uh, boy, I, we would love to hear, uh, you know, I kind of went, oh, just glanced over your background, but why don't you just give us your, your story, uh, just to intro into the topic we're going to be covering today. Yeah, sure. So uh, I am an entrepreneur for now uh, two decades plus, and uh, ever since I, I graduated college, I have been an entrepreneur. I've had the, the good fortune of, of building a couple of companies and selling them. The misfortune, which actually now in retrospect is probably the greatest fortune then, of starting a third business. I became an angel investor. I I'd accumulated wealth through selling my two companies. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to do this on hyperspeed, start all these different businesses. But that was an abject failure. I, I really went to a space where where I had no clue, I had total ignorance about the space, coupled with arrogance. And that combination of ignorance and arrogance <laughs> is a deadly is a deadly combination. Wow. Um, it took me two years and I eradicated all my wealth. The, I remember seeing, logically I could see my bank accounts declining, but uh, emotionally had not accepted it until the day 
I got a call from my accountant who suggests I declare bankruptcy. And uh, that was the wake up call to go home to my family and tell them what I'd done. And then we lost everything. I never declared bankruptcy. I decided I had to dig out of my own hole. Um, but we did lose our house as a consequence. We couldn't afford it. We lost our possessions, our car, and whatever. Um, it had started new. During that process, I actually went through depression. Uh, not to make this a depressing kind of interview, but I went through it. And, and what I found is, shockingly, there's a huge number of entrepreneurs, business owners that experience depression. Well, during that period, I found an outlet for me, which which spawns the, the last part of my life story. And uh, what it was, it was journaling. Just, and what journaling was, was not just writing down like, oh, I had a great day or trying to write down the highlights of the day. It was just writing down anything just to vent out what was kind of bouncing around in my head. And so I wrote every thought, any thought on that paper, you know, terrible thoughts, um, regret and embarrassment for what I'd done with my, my uh, professional career as an entrepreneur. And out of that came some ideas that I thought, wow, I should, I should really write a book. Not, not for others necessarily, but for myself. I wrote a book called The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur and, uh, and fell in love with the process of being an author. I devoted my life to it. So for the last 10 years and today, I'm happy to say that I'm a full-time author and uh, writing books that hopefully help other entrepreneurs navigate the, the ch huge challenge that's in front of us, the countless new problems that arise with the hope that we're going to be successful. And uh, I hope my books are a guide, and, a guide for them to achieve that definition of success they have for themselves. God, that's a great, great story. I, uh, I, I can very much relate to it. I mean, I have my mm -hmm. uh, 62 years here. You know, I've, I've uh, worked on the corporate side of things. I've, I've started my own businesses. I've uh, failed in my own businesses. Right. I've, I've been in internet uh, companies that right during the bubble burst. I mean, I, you know, just all kinds of things. And, and uh, you know, so much of what you have presented in, in, in your books ha just, wow, just rings true for me because it, uh, it can be, you know, I mean, not to go into that dark side here, but it can be really depressing. I mean, there was a point when my businesses where I was seriously contemplating suicide and, and, uh, and it's a, it's not a good place to be. And, and, uh, you know, it was as I look back on it, I was kind of thankful for you know you being able to pull myself out of that too, and you know by taking a, a, a step of faith for myself. But uh, I'll tell you, it uh, yeah, there it there are ups and downs, especially sure. if you're, you're you're a solo you know entrepreneur, yeah, and you got nobody to talk to, yeah, and, you know that that's real tough. So anyway, yeah, let's go. I'm talking too much here, but that, yeah, I totally uh, appreciate that. Thanks for that intro. Oh, no problem. And, and you, what I found is entrepreneurship, just as your point of bill, it's a lonely game for most of us. I have defined it now as what I call entrepreneurial poverty. And I think most of us live in this state. Not all of us, but many entrepreneurs do. And I'm trying to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. What entrepreneurial poverty is to me is the day you say you're going to start a business and you, you have all that fervor and excitement about it. Your friends look at you and they think overnight, they're like, oh, my God, you started a business. You're a millionaire. They think you're extremely wealthy instantly. And they think you live a lifestyle of, of total freedom. They say, oh, you don't even work for it. You can do whatever you want when you want. But the reality is most entrepreneurs don't make anything. Uh, they're, they're actually sacrificing any of their savings just to support the business and the, maybe the people they hired. And uh, they work like animals. They work relentlessly. So that's the great irony is that for most entrepreneurs, the outside perception of, of this wealth and success we have is, is the total opposite. And it does result in these struggles, the depression, this almost like sometimes, you know, I say we, you know, fake it till you make it. Sometimes people are like, I'm, I'm faking it, but I'm never making it. And uh, it can be full of challenges. There's a way out. And that's why I hope to, you know, of course, provide people. But I, I think if anyone listening in right now feels they're there, um, I, I'm with you. you know, Bill, you've been there too. Like, we're with you. It's, it, it, you. There is a way out. Yeah, I think uh... – Profit first was great. In fact, when I, you know, I first uh, 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 communicated with you, you know, I was thought, well, we're going to talk about profit first, which is a great book and um, Thank you. just excellent information. But it's focused on the financial side, and the financial side, 
I mean, that's very real. And that's where a lot of us get into trouble is, you know, just being able to effectively manage the the financial side of our business, especially the profit side, and which I I loved Profit First. But this new book that you have just absolutely mesmerized me here is uh, Clockwork, which is the time part of it. And, and and that is to me is is huge. Maybe we could just kind of zero in on that, and maybe you could pull in some some uh, wisdom from Profit First too. But I, I I think that boy, you know that that's the part that just uh, overwhelms me sometimes. These stacks of papers, mm. the, all of these things I have. Oh, this is legal. I got to deal with. Oh, but this is fine. And oh, well, this is. And then you, you know you're just like you spend all your time. <laughs> I'm digging into papers and and dealing with things, and you, you're kind of going, wait a minute, am I doing anything to generate funds today? You know, so um, yeah, just maybe you could just kind of move in in that direction, see what uh, see what we can. Yeah, find. yeah. So there is this thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I, I recently was studying it, and now feel that time management, if you will, is part of it. So just a quick kind of primer on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I know a lot of people recognize the name. It was new to me conceptually, so maybe for someone else it may be new. But basically what he purported is that there's a foundational need everyone has, and it's the need for oxygen. Like if we don't have air that we're breathing, uh, we will do anything to get oxygen. Otherwise, we're suffocating. And when you go up from that, we need nutrition, You know, food, water. You can go up from that, we need shelter. And uh, once those needs are met, we continue to elevate up to belonging to a community, to feel and express love. And the highest level is uh, is self-actualization. Well, I, I looked at this and I said, oh my gosh, this translates into what we experience as entrepreneurs. We, ha- Our business has a base level need. It's oxygen and sales. Like if my business doesn't have any sales whatsoever coming in, I'm out of business. I need some source of inbound cash flow sales. So every business starts off and needs sales. The next level up is profitability. And profitability is different than sales. Sales is the oxygen. I consider profit to be the the nutrition, you know, the food, the water. And uh, without it, our business will wilt away. So I've seen businesses and myself, I, I had a business, you know, millions of dollars in revenue dying uh, and not having any profit and on the risk of going, on the verge of going out of business. Uh, and some sadly do because they're they have sales, but they don't have profit. So sales is the foundational element of this Maslowian hierarchy of entrepreneurial needs. Next level up is profit. I, I believe the next level up is time. And that's equivalent to the to shelter, if you will, uh, in the traditional model. But in the business model, we want and need to protect our time. You, sadly, I and I suspect so many people listening in for a period of their lives or maybe even today consider themselves workaholics. I actually proudly wore that badge of honor. I remember, Bill, I had a call with a friend of mine. His name was John. It's many years back. And he goes, uh, oh, what a grueling day I had yesterday. I only got four hours of sleep. And I said, ha, four hours? I only got three hours of sleep. Like I, <laughs> I, was, I was bragging about my lack of sleep and proudful of that. I mean, what shame I, sh- I have now for that. But that was the reality. What we need to do is shelter time. The goal of an organization, of your business, of your real estate investments, is to yield income, but also to yield time, to to give you time. And so why didn't clockwork was specify a sequence of seven steps that evaluate or to uh, give you time back. The idea is to have your business run itself, because when you do that, you can do what you want in your life. But also, if you want to insert yourself in the business, you have the ability to select how you insert yourself in the business. Yeah, th- and this is what I love. This and I'll, I'll, boy, we talk a lot on this show about passive income, and you know, all we're, you know, I mean, one of the appeals to real estate investing for those that are retired or or, or nearing retirement is, oh, this passive source of income that can come in. Mm-hmm. But what we find is the passive disappears and we're dealing with the massive part of running a business. And and that's where we get lost. We're kind of going, wow, all this time I thought I would have to hang out with my wife and travel and see my grandkids and do all these things. And, you know, I'm waking up at three in the morning. I'm working until, you know, you know, 10 o'clock at night. I'm going, wait a minute. You know, I thought I was retired. So, I mean, yeah, I I. I I, having that more time part is is really key here. I want to hear more. 
Yeah, I, I think that many entrepreneurs, and regardless if it's an investment in real estate as we've been talking about, or any kind of business, we, we are the the source behind it. I, I think that many of us see this as a parent-child relationship, meaning when I start my business or whatever the endeavor is, I say, you know, I've given life to this. I've started it. I am there for the parent, and this is the child. And what I will do is nurture this. I will feed this. And at a certain point, my business will have enough momentum and legs where it can fly the coop, doesn't need me anymore, and it can pay me back. So we see this this um, event of of leaving our business and the business, re, you know, returning or reaping rewards for us financially, financially as an event. Uh, and we think it's going to be a, a, a switch. One day it's just going to happen. That big client comes swooping in or, or something. What I found the reality is, is that we don't have a parent-child relationship with our business. In fact, I think the far better analogy is that of conjoined twins. <laughs> <laughs> I really literally think my business and me are, are linked at the hip, critical organs. Uh, we share a heart, everything. And as the business goes, so do I go. As I go, so does the business go. That's how conjoined we are. Well, therefore, the separation of us from the business is not that one day this we're just magically separated and the business is returning a, f- a favor to me by, by rewarding me financially. What happens is we need to surgically disconnect ourselves from the business. It's a very deliberate surgical process. It takes time. Um, but what we do is systematically remove ourselves, peel ourselves out of the business, give the business – ongoing independence, you know, growing independence. And at a certain point, we're fully separated. When we are fully separated, that's when the business uh, is, is now running itself and we can reap rewards from it. I think some people get fearful of that because they say, well, if I'm separated from my business, it's lost, you know, me. Like, I'm, I'm not it anymore. Like, you know, and our ego kicks in. I think the reality, though, is when we separate ourselves from the business properly, while we don't share critical organs, organs anymore, you know, we do share a soul. Um, so... That will always be there. But I think it now also gives us the freedom to work within the business if we so choose in the way we want. The, the last thing I wanted to share with you, Bill, is that I think the most critical thing we need to understand is that our job as an entrepreneur is not to be the superhero and swoop into our business and save it yet again. Uh, our job as an entrepreneur is not to be the do-everything person. Our job is actually not to do much at all in the activities, like the doing activities, but really to be a thinker, to really have a clear vision or outcome that we want for our business, and then orchestrate the resources we have around us. Maybe it's employees, maybe it's contractors, maybe it's a software, maybe it's a blend, often it is, of all those things. And our job now is to have a very clear vision and intention where we want to take our business and then choreograph our organization, all the resources to get us to that vision. And this is now an involvement that we have from afar, but on a, it could be a daily, weekly, monthly basis, but we're making tactical and strategic decisions, decisions to move us there. But the business's day-to-day survival not, does not depend on us. When we're in that position, we now have a business that is positioned to scale, uh, a, position, a business that doesn't need us to swoop in anymore and save it. Uh, it's a business that is much more thought out there is a statue dedicated to the most important role we can serve. It's a very famous statue. It's called the Thinker, and you know, here's this naked guy with his chin on his fist, just sitting there contemplating, thinking. Sadly, most entrepreneurs, most investors, don't spend enough time thinking. It's just a quick action, and then it's followed up by quick panic, day-to-day survival, reverting to the urgent. We need to focus on the orchestration of our resources to get us to our vision. That's our primary job as a business owner. Yeah, that's great. I love that idea, choreographing, um, orchestrating, really directing your business where uh, so many of us are just, you know, we're more wearing a fire helmet, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, we kind of come into it with the idea, I got to put out this fire and do this, you know, uh, you know, deal with these, these urgent issues and, don't step back. I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, you know, it's funny. I, I myself have, have lived through it. So in my own business, I remember uh, this was a tur- another turning moment for me. You know, I think as, as we reflect upon our lives, we often see these moments that kind of awaken us. And I remember 
I was living the profit first model. I'd already written it. Um, and I had started researching out business efficiency, but hadn't gotten there yet. Hadn't figured it out. And this one particular night I was in my office, which was in a cookie factory. I had, was able to put together a deal with a, a good friend of mine who gave me free office space, a very profit first and frugal way to, to build a business. And my windowless office was above the ovens in the factory. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <been fun. laughs> and I remember this day, this one summer, it was 90, you know, these hot summers we're having now, 95 or 96 degrees outside. And inside, it was breaching 100 degrees. No air conditioning, the ovens, it was just a fan blowing on me. And uh, sitting there and actually taking this perverted sense of pride, this, this workaholism thing. Uh, and as I walked out that one night, I looked up, uh, proudly walking out saying, I'm a workaholic and I just get things done. And I look up and I'm like, wow, I haven't seen the sun. I looked up at the stars yet again. I had been coming in before the sun had rose and I'd been leaving before the sun had, after the sun had set. And that was kind of a wake up call saying, this doesn't seem like this is life. It seems like actually I've put life on a shelf. That's no way to be an entrepreneur. It, it really is about designing a business that gives us the freedom we want as we define it, both financial freedom and I think now more as importantly, uh, time freedom, the freedom to experience life. Could you too, uh, even though I've, I've mentioned your, your book before and uh, there's uh, probably plenty that uh, know about Profit First, could you just kind of give us just the concept of Profit First in, uh, just in sort of a nutshell um, sure. so people can understand that concept? Yeah, so I'll tell you the discovery and then the concept. The discovery was that uh, I read an article, 83% of small businesses globally, this is in the U.S. and everywhere, are surviving check by check. They're not sustainably profitable. They may pay a shell game with profit and say, oh, we're, we've plowed it back into our business, which simply means it's an expense, by the way. Um, hmm. But they don't have profits above and beyond a normalized salary for the owner. And uh, that kind of confounded me because that means – there's people smart enough to start a business. They're courageous enough. They have enough drive and to do all the elements of running a business, sales, marketing, service, product, millions of different things we need to do. Yet we can't figure out the one last part, which is profit. What's wrong with us? Well, I then started uh, to look at the formula that we use and the foundational formula for profit is sales minus expenses equals profit. And I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, that's the problem. In that formula, the traditional formula, we are told that profit comes last. And it's human nature. When something comes last, it means it's insignificant. It literally means like for many of us, myself in particular, I remember going to my account at the end of the year and saying, hey, was there a profit this year? He said, ah, sorry, nothing. I said, well, maybe next year. I literally delayed profit, the consideration profit, for 365 more days. The, it's human nature. When something comes last, it gets delayed. When something comes first, it gets addressed. Like if, if I had a rush, if I was rushed to the hospital and my doctor says, you got to make some major changes in your life uh, if you want to live, I don't come out of the hospital saying, you know what, starting today, I'm going to put my health last. Of course not. I say, starting today, I'm going to put my health first. So why it's teaching profit first, the formula is real simple. We just flip it. It's sales minus profit equals expenses. And the foundational principle of profit first is this. Every time you have a deposit go into your business, every sale you make, a predetermined percentage it can be 5 or 10 or 15 or 20%, but a predetermined percentage is allocated to a profit. It's reserved. Then you run your business off the remainder. And by taking that profit out first, hiding it away from yourself in, in a bank account so you don't even see it or can't access it, your business uh, will now be reverse engineering profitability. It will know exactly what it needs to survive off of and, and do. And profit first, that's the base principle. There's, there's basically four core principles, but that's the foundational one. If you start taking your profit first, you'll start reverse engineering that profitability. And I'm very proud to say we have, we're have approaching 100,000. We know over 75,000 companies are now doing profit first. That consistently, these companies are not just posting profits. Uh, they're actually growing faster than their contemporaries. And I think the reason behind that, which kind of caught me off guard, was when they take their profit first, they become much more concerned about their use of funds and they use their funds much more effectively. They don't only do the marketing that works. They don't just, ah, I should do Facebook ads kind of guessing. They pick the stuff that works. They measure the clients that are profitable. When that key metric of profits in front of you, uh, you make sure it happens. 
and you make sure it happens in a way that wows customers so well, aka generating more profit, that they in turn turn you on to more customers and sparks even more growth for many of these businesses. Yeah, I just fell in love with that concept when I read the book too. You know, mentioning you know Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, the idea of putting food and water, <laughs> you know, in alignment with profitability, I think is is so true because this is what you know this is what the entrepreneur lives off of, right? Is the profit, and if if you don't have that, I mean, you 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 know, you're not going to survive long. I'd like to, you know, see how much uh, we could kind of get into the um, time aspect here. I because I, I I think it's great to, you know, look at profit first, how that is is critical in terms of of running your business. Now, you know, how do you get there? How do you manage that? Is the big question, right? How do you how do you, how do you allocate your time? So you know, you only have so many hours in a day to be able to really move things forward. So. Um, I, you know, maybe we could try to tackle as many as the you know those steps as possible. If if uh, you think you can, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll walk you through the process, and and maybe we can kind of pause between each step and and see if it, it helped. Um, I, I outlined seven steps in Clockwork, and um, it, it did take me six years to write this book. The reason it took so long is I like to spend a lot of time investigating and learning about process and testing out my own businesses. That's part of it. The second part of it is uh, I'm really committed to finding a super simplified method to achieve something. And clockwork was just too complex uh, until I find something out about beehives, which I'll sh- share in a minute. That was the eye opener of eye openers for me and w- what defines organizational efficiency. So the, the first step, though, in the clockwork system, I call it the 4D mix. What you need to know is in your business the, that there's kind of four stages that our business goes through. Um, and as an entrepreneur, we're, we're doing these four stages and ultimately as we scale and grow and hire employees, we're doing these four stages. So what are they? Well, they all start with a D. The first one is the doing phase and the doing phase is where you actually do work. You're delivering uh, a product or service to your customer or you're, you're doing an activity that supports the deliverable of that, that deliverable, that product or service. That's called the doing. And uh, every business has to be doing. If you're not doing, uh, your business, your clients won't benefit and your business will tank. But as you start to grow, we have to, uh, as entrepreneurs, move up to the next level, which is called deciding. Deciding is where you hire those that first one or two employees, and you give them specific tasks to take care of. I call it task rabbiting. You, know, you go and um, create some right, create some invoices or something. They go and create those invoices, and they come back like 30 seconds later and say, oh, should I sort these invoices by last name or first name? And we make a decision. We say, oh, you know, let's do it by last name. And they leave and they come back a minute later and they have the new question and we decide. It's this constant stream of interruptions that are necessary so that they can get direction. Now, for many businesses, there's only a certain number of employees we can have before all this decision making for everyone else becomes distracting and frustrating. I think sometimes it's around two, maybe three employees. That's why uh, most businesses in the country, most businesses, I think it's upwards of 90 percent, are three employees or less. Because it's really hard to manage by making decisions for everyone. Actually, I even discovered this Hindu goddess. Her name is Kali. And Kali is a, is a single female head with eight arms. And that's what we've become. Like this one head managing eight arms. To the point where some people say, this is, this is nonsense. Everyone I hire seems to be an idiot. I'm going to run the business just myself. I was far faster, far more f- efficient when I was alone. And they fire everyone. And they go back to the way it was, only to be overwhelmed with all the doing. So the doing... Uh, shifts up to deciding, but deciding can be a trap because it overwhelms us. The only way out of the deciding phase is to move on to delegation or delegating. But the true definition of delegating, many people don't understand or appreciate what true delegation is. And what that is, is the assignment of outcomes. I don't say, hey, go do invoices. I say, we need to bill our customers on time uh, and accurately. Your responsibility is to ensure that happens. Do you understand? And, and get, get to agreement on the outcome. Then I say, we have now, we have best practices to get there. And I'll give you some stuff we've captured that you can replicate. But whenever you face a roadblock or challenge into getting timely invoices and accurate invoices out, I've hired you for what's on your shoulders. It's your head. You have to find our way through it. So delegation is assignment of outcomes. And the most important thing is that it's also uh, relinquishing decision making to the employee. They have to be empowered to make decisions. That moves us on to the final stage, which is designing, and that's what we started off talking about. This is the choreographed 
dance, if you will, of our resources. Designing is where we have a clear intention or vision of where we want to take the business to. And then it's making strategic decisions based upon the parameters around us to make that a reality. Sadly, most entrepreneurs are very reactional and they say, oh my God, we have a customer that's complaining today. Everyone just fix that customer. And we don't consider that vision of where we're taking the business. That has to be part of every decision that's made during the designing phase. So that's the four Ds. And the starting point is to analyze where do we stand now? The book released today, but the pre-release went out about a month or two ago. And so I'm starting to get reader feedback already. And uh, no surprise, many readers say, oh my gosh, all I'm doing is the doing. I never even considered designing and always aligning with that outcome I intend for my business. So that's the first stage, understanding where you stand today. Got it. And and I think this being a real critical step here, and, and, and it's a place I think a lot of entrepreneurs, I know I have, get kind of overwhelmed because you're at that point where you're going, all right, do I have enough money right now to hire? Do I have enough right. money to you know pay other people to do things? Um, how do I know and how do I allocate proper? properly so that I, I, you know, I'm doing the right thing. Otherwise I can end up in trouble. Yeah. So I think when people think about hiring, they think they default to the full-time employee and say, I can't afford that person that I pay, you know, $50,000 a year. I'm not even making half of that currently or whatever the numbers are. I'm just, you know, spitballing here. I think we default to full-time and I think that's a mistake because imagine this. Imagine hiring a full-timer, which means 100% growth in your business. Imagine if like Google, who I don't know how many employees they have, say 70,000 70, employees. Could you imagine Google announces tomorrow morning, hey, we're, we're growing by 100%. We're adding 70,000 new employees tomorrow. I mean, the stock would probably tank. It is such a massive growth. It puts so much pressure on the organization. So when a small business says, you know, we're going to add a new full-time employee, and this is the first full-time employee, that's the same effect that Google would have in doubling also. It's so much pressure on the business. So the better choice is, to, I think, to hire part-time people, virtual assistants, project contractors, you know, that are doing specific projects, and to bring in small pieces. Now you're hiring, instead of, you know, 100% growth of of effort, meaning hiring someone that can put out 100% effort or double what you're doing, we're just adding 5% or 10% because we're bringing in ad hoc people. That's the way to do it. And in my own organization, I have a lot of part-timers here. We have, we have 10 employees, but I think five people are part-time, six people are part-time. Um, and here's a great secret. If you give someone uh, eight hours of work, but only give them four hours to do it, they still get it all done. They just do it in four hours. So you get a lot of bang for your buck, if you will, working with part-timers. And I also feel it's not taking advantage of these people because these people that work here part-time all have other life endeavors they want to pursue. So they're they're putting more value in the flexibility of work than just cranking out hours. Oh, that's great. Now, you mentioned the the, the bee analogy. And yeah. The honey. yeah. Uh, could you kind of uh, elaborate on that as we kind of move into the next phase? Of that? Yeah, I'll move you into step two and three real quickly. So um, step two is finding the QBR. So every organization, every organization has this thing called the queen bee role. At least that's why I've labeled it. It's the one critical, most critical function in a business that the business is hinging its success on. Well, I found this. I couldn't find it in an organization initially. Uh, I found it in beehives and then saw that the beehives have the answer to all organizations. Here's what it is. For a beehive to survive and, and thrive, it has a critical role that must be served. It's the laying of eggs. If eggs are being produced, then the beehive colony can grow. Beehives have a very sh- life a short lifespan, usually like four, six, maybe eight weeks max. So constant production of eggs is very important. Every bee knows that. And they know it's the most critical role in the in the beehive. I want, I want to say, by the way, I'm not suggesting that the queen bee, the only bee that serves that role, is the most critical bee. She serves the most critical role, no question about it. But if the queen bee dies or is not producing effectively, she's removed and they will spawn a new queen bee. So it's the laying of eggs that's most critical. Well, we have to look at our organizations and say, you know, what are what are we looking to th- survive, let alone thrive on? And one example I've been using recently is Federal Express. If we look at FedEx, th- the thing that they thrive on, what they're known for, also known as a brand promise, is 
they deliver packages on time. If it absolutely positively needs to be there by X, we'll get it there then. That's the brand promise. If we then peel the onion back one layer, we then look at what's the most important activity we do that makes that brand promise a reality. That's the queen bee role. That's the queen bee role. So we have, and by the way, for, for FedEx, it's logistics, right? They make sure packages move around. They hinge your success on it, by the way. If they said, you know what, forget logistics. Let's, let's just be customer service oriented and make people really happy. Well, if they focus on that, you know, friendly voices on the phone, but they failed now to deliver packages on time, they would go out of business. It is the most critical role. Now, this isn't true just for FedEx. I use them because they're a big name that we all know. But for every business, small businesses, our business, your business, we have to identify what's the one thing we intend to be known for. What's our brand promise? Then determine what's the one most important activity that supports it, and that's our queen bee role. That was step two. And let me just go to step three real quick because it kind of kicks in. Step three is we call protect and serve. Every employee now needs to know the importance of it. And if the queen bee role is stopping or not working properly, like the eggs aren't being laid, the bees, all the bees take action to spark that process again because their lives depend on it. If FedEx, if the logistics start getting swamped and they start they're overwhelmed and not delivering packages on time, employees step in and take on that role. Actually, it happens every winter holiday season. You know, the FedEx gets overwhelmed. The managers don't just start yelling at employees, say, deliver faster, better. They get in the vans and start delivering themselves because all of their lives, I'm doing air quotes around it, depend on it. FedEx depends on it. So we need not only to identify our QBR, we need to make sure it's protected and served at all times. Hmm. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, now, is, is that, would you say that, that QBR is, um, it, 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 could it be multiple people? Is it, you know? Yeah, one, it's a great question. Yeah. yeah, so the QBR does not need to be a single person. And a small organization is often the entrepreneur or sometimes the most highly paid employee that's serving it. But it can be multiple people, and I'd argue it should. So that if one person is able, unable to deliver on the QBR, the others can fill in for it. You know, if you think about a doctor's office, if you go to a small doctor's office, the QBR is the role is examinations, right? That's what matters most in most doctor's offices. If there's one doctor serving it, that doctor is serving the most important role. As a doctor's office grows, uh, some will start having a consortium of doctors, you know, multiple doctors in there. Many of the doctors will be able to do each other's work. So now – if one doctor uh, goes away on vacation or gets sick herself or something, the other doctors can fill in and the patients get served unabated. Now, doctor's office, may, they may have rapport with individual customers, so some of that rapport may be compromised, so that will have to be addressed, but at least the service can go on unabated. As entrepreneurs, we should look to do the same thing. We should not be looking to serve the QBR ourselves. We should actually be looking to peel ourselves out of it, have other people doing it, so we can get back to choreographing our organization to organizing our resources. That's great. Well, you know, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road here is, is yeah, now, you know, you've got, you've got to take all this information in the talent and to be able to create, you know, I, I guess systems, right. Uh, to be able to make that happen. And, and that to me is, you know, the most efficient companies out there are those that have been able to capture and create systems that they can just keep duplicating and duplicating and duplicating. So yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the goal, the goal here is to capture systems. We, we need systems that other people can follow. I think the challenge I found as I studying these businesses is the traditional approach is SOPs, checklists, and so forth. While those make sense in our current times, uh, not many people refer to SOPs. They, they sit on shelves. Or often you create a checklist, you know, do this, go to that website, then do that, and you write this seven or ten steps, and the day you release the checklist, the website has been updated or the functions are different, and so your checklist is out to dry. I found a faster way to uh, capture systems and train people on them, and the process is simply by recording them. As I do an activity, I can use screen capture software if it's on a computer. I can use my smartphone to record an action or something I'm saying. And as I do it, for example, maybe I'm, I'm doing the invoicing right now. I do an invoice. I record it. I also speak over it, explain what I'm doing. So I'm actually completing work as I'm going along. But with this recording, I now give it to the person I want to transfer the task to. And now they have a system to follow. And 
That's how it works. So you can use capture mechanisms to capture systems. The beautiful thing is even with a brand new business, many of the systems are already out there. I ran an experiment with people here about peeling bananas, and, and we don't have time to go into it, but there's a couple ways you can peel bananas. Uh, maybe you want to Google it, best way to peel a banana. And uh, people had their own established systems. I said, you know, there's a better system out there, but instead of me teaching you, just go to YouTube and type in better way to peel a banana. And now everyone here has found a better way to peel bananas. Many people did not know this <laughs> system existed, right? So the power is that you sometimes don't even need to create the systems. You type in what you're trying to do and go on YouTube and you may find the system has been already created for you and you can integrate that into your company immediately. Mm, that's I, I like that. I like the idea of uh, recording it. Uh, you know, t too many people I know. <laughs> I'm talking too many. I'm talking more about myself. But you know, my whole thing is you know creating an operations manual. So the idea is that everything that I do yeah. will eventually be able to go to other people. But you get so I get so hung up on the writing of it, you know, and and having to you know well describe it to such degree that I, you know, I just never get very far. And I love the idea of just okay, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to I'm going to have hold up my phone here and record what I'm doing and just pass the video on to that person that uh, you want to delegate to. I love that. Yeah, super simple, super fast, super effective. Uh, and then there's one little additional caveat you can do is once they have the system, ask them to record their own version of it. Because ultimately the best student is the teacher. So when they can teach the process on a video next, then you know they've mastered it. Mm, I like that. I like that. Well, let's uh, keep going. Let's uh, let's let's see what else. Uh, All right, what I'll, else? I'll try to bang through the last uh, two or three here pretty quickly. So, um, there is actually three more steps. The, the next one is balancing the team, and the idea behind this is once you uh, are assigning out uh, responsibilities, uh, processes like we've been talking about, we want to match up the right people with the right tasks in the right portions, um, and as opposed to matching people's traits or talents to titles like we traditionally do. Like I want to hire a great receptionist and a receptionist means they answer the phone, they greet people walk in, they fill out this you know spreadsheet and track things, they all do some light accounting. Instead of matching people to a title, match them to their traits. So maybe you have someone who's amazing at greeting people face to face and great on the phone but never should touch an accounting system. Does that mean they're a bad receptionist? Well, as I defined all those roles, yes, but they're perfect for a part of the receptionist role, that trait. They may also be great for part of the sales role, building the initial rapport with prospects and customers. So what we want to do, instead of filling in titles, we want to fill in the tasks that need specific traits and have our organization not be that pyramid structure, but much more of an interlaced web. That's how you balance the team. The, the next step is called the commitment. Uh, this may sound a little bit bass backwards to people, but this is the phase as we're building efficiency in our business where we identify the customers that benefit from it most. Now, you'd think, shouldn't I pick the customer first and build around them? But the reality is we pick you first and build around you. We need to find out you as the entrepreneur and your company what your talents are, what your superhero strengths are, and then target that at a community that serves best. So guess what? The customer does not come first here. Customer comes after we know who you are and we align your offering to match the customer's needs. Um, and this way you're playing into your strengths and pay, serving customers that most need it. And then the final stage of uh, the clockwork process, step number seven, is going to full automatic mode. This is where we actually physically extract you from the business. Uh, I, I suggest in the ultimate decrees making a four-week vacation, four consecutive weeks disconnected from the office. But the goal here is to actually remove you from the office for uh, extended periods of time. And I know many businesses now are virtually, so we just virtually disconnect you, digitally disconnect you from the office and see how the business runs without you. And I found even solopreneurs can do this with a structure of uh, virtual help, contractors and so forth, and automation around them. If we can pull you out ultimately for one, uh, one consecutive month, well, then we can do it forever. So that's what we're aspiring to get to. But we'll build into it. We'll get you out for a week, see how that went, fix problems that occurred, get you out for a couple weeks, come back, see what happened, fix problems, and get you up to where you're taking four weeks off. And uh, one last thing I found is if you can take four weeks off from, from your business, you have a business that can run on automatic. Uh, you have the freedom now to do what you want, when you want, back in your business if you so desire, also in your life. And also your value skyrockets because for an acquirer, 
they see a business that's generating income without the effort of the owner, that's a plug and play business. And that's very appealing to acquirers. That's, this is, that's my favorite step. I, I know when I've scheduled that four week vacation that I finally arrived, <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, just, the, yeah. just the idea of a four week vacation just sounds like, wow, that that's, that's great stuff. Well, you know, this is, this has been really, really super helpful here. I, I just a couple, couple more questions, uh, in more of a general context here, you know, our audience are, are primary primarily folks that are, you know, 50 years of age and older. Yeah. Um, so they're either approaching retirement or they're already in retirement. And they're looking at uh, real estate investing as a means to be able to supplement yep. their retirement years. Now, you're taking into account our audience, I mean, these are people that have, you know, they've sort of served their time. You know, they, they've been in a job for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're, they're ready to ready to retire, but you know, financially, you know, maybe there are some, some restrictions there. What, what advice would you have for that group that, uh, you know, is looking at it, you know, again, uh, real estate investing, they may be thinking maybe I'll pick up, you know, four houses or maybe a small apartment or something. And, and that'll be enough to supplement my income. W what kind of advice would you give them in terms of, you know, what, what would be some, some critical steps you would see, you know, considering their age and, yeah. and uh, you know, starting a new venture like this? Yeah. I mean, if anything, uh, we want a business that's less and less dependent upon us. You know, in my 20s, I was like, I'm going to carry this all my back. And I did it through raw effort. Through my 30s, I said, well, maybe it isn't a good idea, but I kept doing it. In my 40s, I was like, oh, uh, I can't keep, <laughs> keep doing it. I realized that if, the day I'm removed from the business, if it's dependent upon me, the business – will will struggle or die. So if the business has dependency on you, that is not a um, that's not an ATM machine. That's not that's not an annuity by any stretch of imagination if it's dependent upon your effort. So we want to extract ourselves. Now the thing is you don't need to have this massive structure of you know hundreds of employees and stuff to have a business that's independent of you. You can do it, like I said, by yourself. And even to the point where um, maybe you don't want to be a hundred percent out, but maybe some of or a good portion of the tasks are taken off your plate. So you can just do the stuff that you get the most fulfillment and joy out of. Uh, I do know this. With all the tools that have been developed, all the automation, all these different packages, all this different software and artificial intelligence that's out there now, little micro companies, even companies of one or two, can compete with mega corporations because of just the raw automation and tools that are out there. I think there's no excuse. I think if, if you today are working and making your real estate business successful and, and putting a lot of sweat and effort into it. I wonder, I just want to put this challenge out there. If you're in a habit of the past thinking you need to make all this effort, that's where I was. I thought I had to push myself harder and harder. And uh, it's really been since writing this book and this process that I realized the more successful my business is, the less it needs me. Mm, that's great. That's great. Great advice. Um, you know, with with time management, they're obviously uh, prioritizing and, and being able to prioritize has is, is, got to be critical, I would imagine. What key points might you give? And maybe I'm, I'm sure you elaborate more on your book on this. But, uh, you know, in terms of looking at oh, this massive stuff I have to deal with, maybe just, you know, a few quick tips would you give to people that are trying to prioritize the things that they, they have to do as they're launching into a new business? Yeah, so... We got to figure out for your new business what that queen bee role is. What's the most critical thing that you're hinging your business success on? Now, I know everything has importance. I'm saying everything doesn't have the identical importance. Something is a priority over something else. You have to determine what the greatest priority is. That's the true important thing. Then what we do is we uh, look at all the other tasks we do, including that one, and see how much time those other tasks take. The time we spend on those other tasks are time taking us away from that core task, that most important thing, the QBR often. So that realization hopefully wakes, wakes you up to start transferring that work for other people to, to do the work. You as a small business, if you're doing the QBR, you got to focus most of your attention on that. Got it. Great. Well, you have uh, definitely, you know, I think the, the role of serial entrepreneur would apply to you. <laughs> You've done, done a lot of companies and, and uh, been successful in many of them. And with your current business, so where do you see it going? And, and what, uh, what would really excite you about uh, what's ahead for, for your company? 
I think the the coolest thing as an author, um, it, you know, one of the things is like, oh my God, you're a creative guy. You write the books. You you can't make your business a clockwork business. It's entirely dependent upon you. And I've now challenged that notion. I don't believe that's true. I um, I've been very blessed with uh, the success of my books, Profit First being my most successful to date. But I think clockwork is going to now eclipse it in that um, these have spawned licensing deals and businesses. And so I've transferred this knowledge uh, to other people and they are running the organizations. I've become a benefactor of, of the business's success but without any effort. So I actually, I hope that I am applying clockwork in its true sense to the books I'm writing and intend to continue this journey. I, I, I have a lot of more stuff I need to write about and feel compelled to write about and uh, plan to, as I release those books, to you know, build a clockwork system behind it so I won't be the guy doing the work um, behind it. Uh, nice. That's great. That's exciting. Well, um, I'm sure there's a lot of folks here that want to find out more about you, about uh, what you do. We are definitely going to have link, uh, links not only to your newest book, but to the other books uh, on, on our uh, website and our show notes. But, uh, you know, how, how could people, you know, find out more about you and your company and the things that you do? I know there's a lot of great services you provide for people as well. So what's sort of the best way to get in contact with you? So the, the best way is to go to clockwork.life. I set up a in, in support of this book. I set up a page that has tons of free resources, videos, and PDFs, and and worksheets, and so forth that complement the book. So if you want the singular starting spot, I think that's it. Go to Clockwork L I F E, and uh, I think you'll find tons of resources out there, plus ways to contact me and so forth. Oh, great! And Clockwork already has the Audible book as well. Yeah, Audible released uh, this morning. So the 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 print cut version, the Kindle version, and Audible all came out simultaneously. Oh, exciting! That's great. I love it, man. Well, uh, Michael, this has been such a blast uh, having you on. I, I think I could have held you on for another couple hours, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's> <laughs> that would have been really cruel and unusual punishment here. But um, but we have a tradition here, and uh, hopefully uh, your folks might have informed you about this, but uh, you know, we are called the Old Dogs REI Network, and all of our guests uh, get to close out our show with their best old hound dog howl. Oh, so, I like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, you know, kind of putting you on the spot here, but, uh, you know, just, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'd love to love to have you close us out with that, uh, old hound dog howl. If I recall correctly, I used to listen to a radio show with a guy named, uh, Wolfman Jack. Oh yeah, man. I grew up with Wolfman. Oh, Jack. I remember Wolfman Jack. And I think <laughs> I, I vaguely remember, uh, he had a voice that was kind of gravelly like this. He's like, it's Wolfman Jack. Oh, woo! <laughs> that was great that was great <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah wolfman jack sounded like he was smoking like four packs oh a day my or gosh something. Yeah. <laughs> his voice was classic but uh, oh, that was a great hell thank you thank well you. michael thank you so much for coming on we are so excited uh such some good good information here that uh i'm sure a, a lot of people are going to be able to take with them and obviously if they delve into your books deeper they'll get uh, a lot more details about how to how to be successful in their business ventures here so um i thank you for sharing and uh, thank you for being on oh thank you for having me bill it means a lot uh, well, I also uh, want to thank our old dog listeners here, too, that uh, have uh, taken the time out to join us. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us means a lot, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, please note everything that uh, Michael discussed today and just uh, his books and uh, all the notes from what took place here today will be in our, our show notes section of the Old Dogs website at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog. A look for the show with Michael McCallowitz. That is the show for today. Uh, remember, cash flow is king and real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.